give me your money. Amen. Oh, sorry, just kidding. That's what a lot of people think our gospel reading text is about today. And I'm sure you've heard a stewardship sermon or two, or maybe more, preached on what's commonly referred to as the widow's might. And as I shared with the children, the might, the word might refers to a very, very small amount of money. But that's not really what the text is about. Now, the text, of course, does relate to money. It's the specific example that Jesus uses, after all. But he's making a bigger point. So I'll start a different way. Have you ever been to a great cathedral? Or really, rather, any amazing and magnificent building. One where you walk in and you're overcome with the beauty of the structure, the time it must have taken to make it, and the grandeur on display all around you. This happened to me. The year after I served as a vicar, I did a study abroad in Germany for 11 months. And the first place I went was Cologne, Germany. We had some family friends there, and I stayed with them. And if you've ever been to Cologne, there is a building that dominates the skyline of that city. It is the Cologne Cathedral. And one of the first days I had there where I had the day to myself and I could explore, I wanted to go see it. And so in Germany, there's the section of each city where only pedestrian and bicycle traffic can go, so the buildings are a little closer together. And there's a lot of shops and things and a lot of people walking around. So this area surrounds where the cathedral is. So I was just walking along, kind of taking in the sights and, and, and just, you know, I'm in Germany is what I'm thinking. And I come around the corner of one of these close-together streets, and then a big courtyard opens, and all of a sudden, the biggest church I've ever seen in my life was just appeared in front of me. Because of the way the buildings were, I couldn't see it from afar. And then as soon as I turned a corner, it was just there. And so I, I, am having, I have a picture here for you to just give you a sense of the close-up view of this cathedral. It's so big, and this, I, I had a picture, but I couldn't find it from my own records. So this is one somebody else took, but it expresses the magnitude of this building. It doesn't even fit in any single picture you try to take when you're that close. So I also gave another picture here. Here's an aerial view of the cathedral. And you can get a sense of the scale of this building by looking at these other multi-story buildings around it. So one of the reasons this cathedral survived World War II is it was so massive, it was used by airplanes as a landmark. So this building, the, those steeples in the front are over six, they're 600 feet tall. It's a huge place. But then I went inside. And of course, the inside of the building is beautiful. All right, you can take the picture down. Nobody's going to listen to me with that thing up there. But once you get inside the cathedral, as you'd imagine, it's gorgeous stonework that must have, it was decades to build this place. And beautiful stained glass windows and all the ornate artwork you'd expect in a place like that. But I was also struck by another thing, that it was empty. Most of the cathedrals I went to in Germany were largely empty. Even during the sort of midday services that were held there, most of the people walking around inside this church were like me. They weren't there to worship, they were tourists, admiring the beauty of a grand structure made by the hands of men. Well, in Mark chapter 12, in our gospel reading today, Jesus is teaching us something about what we should value when we see things. And what happened with that cathedral was as grand as the structure as it was and as beautiful of a building as it was, all of that grandeur and beauty was no longer in service to the original purpose for which it was built, to glorify God. Instead, it had become a relic of the past in awe by people who came to see it, but they weren't there because they, liked, they loved God or worshipped God, but because of the building itself and how amazing it is. Now, don't get me wrong, those things aren't bad. But Jesus is teaching us how to view these things in their proper context and with the real value that God intends for all things. 
See, God values things differently than you and I. He sees differently than you do. As Christians, we are called to reorient our vision to line it up with his. An act that we cannot do unless he gives us faith in him. That's what the scriptures mean, and that's what we talk about when we say looking at something with the eyes of faith. Is that our vision has now been redefined to align with that which God has revealed to us in Jesus. And today in Mark 12, Jesus is doing exactly that. So to give a context for this short chunk of Mark 12, right before this, at the beginning of our reading, comes this culmination of Jesus' rebuke of the temple. So the previous chapter is the, the famous time where he goes in and he makes a whip out of the ropes and drives the money changers from the temple. Then he tells the parable of the wicked tenants about how all the people that God has sent to his people to give them his word they have beaten or killed, including his son. And then the beginning of our gospel text today highlights the hypocrisy and pretense of the scribes, highlighting the importance they place on outward magnificence while the inside is empty, much like that wonderful cathedral in Cologne. But just prior to this reading, the people that are most valued in the religious culture of Jesus' day, he says to them, you aren't seeing what you should be seeing. And he's teaching this same lesson to his disciples. Now we know, of course, the disciples famously so much like us. Right after Jesus teaches them this lesson, they immediately don't understand and forget. And they start to they start to swoon over the size of the stones that have built the temple, the very first verse of the next chapter. They're like, Jesus, look at the amazing stones that are making this temple. How amazing are they? And Jesus has to be shaking his head. He's like, I just told you what matters, and this is what impresses you. And so it's fitting, as Jesus normally does, that the image and example he uses to drive his point home can't be further from the grandeur of the temple or the outward appearance of the scribes who have the seats of honor and wear famous and special clothing to draw attention to themselves. He chooses a widow, and not just any widow, but a poor one. Right after, one of the specific rebukes he gives of the scribes is that they devour the homes of widows. Now, there's a little bit behind that phrase because they would have been entrusted with the keeping of the estates. And so Jesus is pointing out there's some corrupting work going on there in the way the estates of these widows have been managed. So now you might understand, as I was preparing for this sermon, why I thought of the cathedral. Both the awe when I turned that corner and it just dominated my vision and the disappointment when it was so empty. How does God value things? Now here I want to be clear, I don't mean value in terms of money. Now of course our view of money is affected by what Jesus teaches here. I'm not going to pretend that that has nothing to do with it. It certainly does. But it's an indirect application of the core teaching that Jesus has here today. I mean value simply by what is important. And again here Jesus, as we have come to expect since our fall into sin, tells us that our natural fallen instincts are exactly the opposite of what God intends. The things that we naturally see that seem important to us are not important to Jesus. In fact, it's often the things we don't see that he has to bring to our attention that are what God values most. So we don't even look for what God values. We're right there with the disciples oozing and swooning over how massive the stones of the temple are and how beauty, beautiful it is in its construction. And in the midst of our awe, we hear the voice of Jesus say, hey, come here. Look at this poor widow. Now, it's quite clear in the progression of this text 
that no one else even saw her. And even if you were looking at the treasury box, you certainly wouldn't account the widow for the small amount that she gave. You would be much more concerned with those who have a lot of money. And you can see that they're putting a portion of that in the offering. And if we're being honest, that we can behave like that sometimes today. Maybe valuing or being more excited about a visitor who looks like what we would hope our visitors would look like as opposed to somebody who we might overlook, like a poor widow. But just like the disciples are being taught here, we are being taught that God values differently. He sees differently. So what does this highlighting of the widow tell us about how God values things? It tells us three main things. One is her person. She would, not be, cons- she would be considered lesser among the crowd of people at the temple. Not lesser because of her intrinsic worth, but she's a more vulnerable and poor person. That's why Christians are called specifically to those types of people, widows and orphans, who don't have all the things that God intends to bless people with. But it's not just because she's poor, but because she as a person to the temple, as corrupt as it is, is of little consequence. The scribes that were earlier rebuked would also not see this woman. Yet Jesus teaches that the purpose of those who have are to bless and care for those who do not. Flipping things on its head. The second is her contribution. Again, it's not due to the value of the money. Because as I shared with the children, she puts in nothing. Almost nothing. But it is the faith in God that the contribution shows. Now, we don't know if she believed in Jesus. The text doesn't tell us that. But she clearly believes in the God of the temple because she gives everything that she has to live on to God. And the third thing is not as obvious. But when you look at the greater context of this, these sets of passages, it becomes more clear. It is her sacrifice. In and of itself, the sacrifice itself is significant, but it's more significant in that what it mirrors is the sacrifice that is to come in Jesus. You see, right after these chapters in the book of Mark begins Jesus' passion and death on the cross. He, like her, had given up everything he had to live on for a corrupt and blind people who could not see, who valued wrong things and undervalued the important things, who didn't even see the things that God values the most. And yet, just like the widow who gave everything she had to live on, our Lord Jesus gives everything he had to live on, literally, his life. For the same sort of people he's rebuking in the temple. It brings a different sort of context to Jesus' rebukes, doesn't it? That he's not rebuking out of anger and judgment and wrath, but out of the hope and the desire that we will turn away from those ways and have faith in him, in his rescue. So dear friends in Christ, I ask you today, do you value this way? Do you see what God sees? The short answer to that question is no. We're like the disciples. Our natural inclinations are drawn to the things that our sinful nature tempts us to value. And even now, as believers in Jesus, our flesh is constantly tempting us back to seeing the world the way we used to, not the way God has revealed to us in Jesus. So you might be wondering, should then you not make beautiful things to glorify God? Should, if you have a lot of money, not give a lot of money because, well, Jesus values percentage giving or whatever. That's not what Jesus is teaching. He isn't condemning the temple because of its grandeur. In fact, in the Old Testament, Jesus and God specifically instructs Solomon to build the temple the way it was built, to reflect his beauty and his glory. What Jesus is rebuking is the pretense is the outward showing that doesn't reflect the inner truth. The purpose of the temple wasn't to be grand and beautiful. 
It was to be the dwelling place of God for the mercy and care of his people. Doesn't do that anymore. Who needs the mercy and care of the people of God more than a poor widow? And yet, she's totally overlooked. So what do we take away today from our text? First, the law tells us that we don't see as we should. We can't. We're blind to the things we should value. But it also teaches us that we have a God who in Jesus draws our attention to those things, points to the things that we overlook, the things we can't see, and says, look here, this is what is important. This is what is valued by God. It is what you ought to value. So the only conclusion that we can draw from that in faith is we should let him be our eyes. We should let the truth of his word teach us and guide us. When it comes to a disagreement between us and God, he is always right. So today, dear brothers and sisters, as he does each Sunday, our gracious God recalibrates our vision, gives us the eyes of faith to see the real important things. That's why I'm not exaggerating or joking when I say that you came here to receive the most precious of gifts in all of creation. There are those who would scoff at that, but not you. You have been given eyes to see that the most precious things are the promises of God, the source of our faith in him, a faith in a gracious God, one who gives up his entire livelihood for corrupt and blind people like you and me, faith that turns weakness into the power of God and those lesser things into the greater things. And how does he show us? The same way he shows his disciples in our reading today. He does it himself. He leads the way and he draws our eyes to him. In the name of Jesus, amen.